Hello my Saab friends, my name is Gary and this is my channel Weakest of Weeks. If you're a first time viewer, I appreciate you clicking on the video. And if you're a long time subscriber and you're wondering where exactly I went, it's been a whirlwind of a probably a month or two. Been doing a lot of stuff, home renovation wise, not so much on the channel, but today I'm ready to get back into some Saab stuff. So here is the Project Arrow and unfortunately it's been quite neglected it's actually very dirty kind of looks like a barn find hopefully pretty soon i will clean this but obviously the weather has not been too spectacular hood has popped open just mainly because i have a battery tender in here this going a couple wood blocks just so the hood doesn't close totally on that give it some breathing room but this is kind of where this is at i haven't really driven it much at all and then of course this is my daily driver so this one as you can see covered in snow right now and what we'll be working on today so i need to brush this off warm the car up pick up some kerosene for the heater and then we're going to get to work on the passenger side front wheel bearing so let's get started A few moments later Back home in the garage, I started the teardown process, mainly starting with that front tire. But what I am doing in the main culprit of this Full on front end rebuild starts with the wheel bearing. I have a wheel bearing that's humming. If you're not familiar with some of the symptoms with that or more information on a wheel bearing, I recently did the rear wheel bearings on this car. So go ahead and click up top for more information on that. I'm also doing a top strut mount or strut bearing, as they call it. I do have some aftermarket ones by Stag. Now, from my understanding, these ones are kind of garbage. I presume you can give more information online by which specific ones these are but I believe these are their matching lowering coil springs the bearing plate up top here that top strut mount it has to turn ever so slightly it is stationary where it mounts to this knuckle you turn the wheel and this top portion where it mounts up top here that shock tire in the engine bay is a slight pivot point so that original bearing is bad I will eventually be replacing it with some Coney Yellow, but for now, this will do. Some Raybestos front brake pads, a matching rotor, a Moog greasable way bar end link. I have some Raybestos caliper pins because I know the original ones are bad. What tends to happen is these get dry, grease goes away, they potentially get replaced without any grease or serviced without any grease. And if you're in a rust belt state or, or anywhere in the world that gets rust, well, unfortunately, they freeze up and can tear apart your caliper and destroy your brake. So that's kind of why I'm replacing the rotor and pad assembly as well as a control arm. So the reason why I ended up buying all these parts instead of just mainly focusing on the wheel bearing is because I recently did the driver's side of this car. I started out just doing the wheel bearing and it turned out I had a bad ball joint, hence buying a control arm. The rotors I thought I could get away with, but they turned out to be pretty gouged and they had some really odd wear marks in the pads. So even if I got the rotors resurfaced, I'd have to buy pads. So at that point, I just decided to buy 
both sets. It's always great to replace things in pairs if you can afford it. It's definitely easier on the maintenance record side of things because you know you replace the strut bearing at the same time, the control arms, the brake rotors, pads, so on and so forth. So it's always great if you can afford it to replace everything in pairs. Unfortunately, if you're doing it yourself, it does equate to more time, effort, if you're paying out somebody else to do it, obviously it's more money. But in the long run, all these parts right here are going on this car. Let's go ahead, tear into this thing further, and, well, unbox all this stuff and get it on the car. So I have a giant arsenal of tools ready to tear this stuff apart, and also while I'm in here, I'm going to clean some stuff up. But because I know I'm going to be doing the wheel bearing and I have to remove the CV axle out of here. I could definitely tell there's surface rust on here. I'm gonna hit it with some penetrating oil, but first we are going to actually take a screwdriver, put it in here. That way it locks everything up. Inch in one quarter, toss it on here. I'm gonna thread this partially back on because it's gonna be froze up inside that wheel bearing because the splines lock into there. So we'll wanna tap this with a hammer to knock it out and we don't wanna mess up the thread. So we'll keep that nut on there for now. Get the screwdriver out there. Next up, there is two grommets that we need to pop out on the backside of this caliper. And they're just little covers. There's gonna be two of them like such. And you'll take a seven millimeter Allen break those loose and what that'll let us do is remove this caliper from the bracket. So here is one of the original slider pins for the caliper and you can see here that's not grease that's actually a buildup of rust. So, I mean, you could probably clean this up, re-grease it, and be fine. But because there's rust on the threads, that is on there. These things are so cheap, it's just so much easier to replace them. Here's the second one in a lot worse of shape. Next up, we want to remove this clip. Now, I don't know of a really easy way to do it. I feel like every single time I do this, I scratch up the caliper. So, by all means, if you have any recommendations on the best way to remove this, comment down below. Yeah, here, before I show you the pad, it's always good to place the caliper on something like a jack stand or like a bungee cord, get it hung up there so it's not just all this weight hanging on that rubber brake hose because you will stretch it. And while it may look fine on the outside, you'll definitely damage it on the inside. You won't have good pedal pressure or the caliper will stick. But so here is the pad and the reason that I'll be replacing them. So the life of them, it's actually in really great shape. There's a lot of life left, a lot of thickness left. Why I'm replacing it is because, and hopefully it picks up on the camera, is we got some nasty grooves in this pad. I got one down here and a couple up top there. So even if you turn this rotor, knock off this rust, we're still going to have grooved pads. So if you reuse these old pads on a new rotor or a newly turned rotor, you're just gonna re-groove that rotor. So. Toss them out, replace them. Pads and rotors are fairly cheap, fairly accessible to get, so might as well just replace them both. Before we go ahead and remove this bracket here and get to these two e-torx bolts, we're running into an issue where we've got to move and push it through uh, this lower strut bolt. So we have a 18 millimeter deep well. We'll knock this out, punch it through. That'll give us space to get access to remove these bolts. Now on the driver's side, these were a nightmare. Whoever changed these last actually used red permanent Loctite, so it took a heck of a lot of force, heat, a breaker bar. It was a, quite a struggle. So I'm really hoping that that is not the case on this passenger side, but first we need to remove this ABS sensor that goes to the wheel bearing and unclip it like such. We'll dangle that down so it's sort of out of the way and we'll get the impact in here with the 18 deep well. And just like the CV axle where we left the nut on here, we're gonna tap it with that nut on there so we don't jack up the threads.
first strut bolt removed. So before we move the second strut bolt, we're gonna go ahead and attack these brake caliper bolts and they are E20 Torx. Good sign, that one is loose. Now onto this lower one. Some remnants of red Loctite on there. Don't use permanent Loctite on something that you may need to service in the future. And one thing I forgot to do, because on the driver's side I didn't have the retaining set screw for the rotor that holds it on. Well, before we fully remove this bracket, we'll want to break this loose. We'll go ahead and do the same method we did for the axle nut here. And in theory, this little five millimeter hex shouldn't have as much torque as this axle nut. But when things get rusted on, they really get fused. Ran into my first major hurdle being this little set screw is stripped. It could have been stripped before I got there, or heck, even I could have stripped it out. But regardless, I have to drill it out to get this rotor off. If you're wondering as far as bit size, I used a half inch monster of a drill bit. Bracket is removed. Here is what's called a tone ring. I believe that's what they call it, but basically it goes on top of this center hub bore here this hub the original one is 65.1 millimeter now because i have aftermarket wheels the center bore of the wheel is actually larger so this little nylon plastic bit it actually acts as a spacer and it helps center the wheel so you don't get any nasty vibrations on the highway so if i wasn't replacing this hub i would be running into issues with getting the remainder of the set screw out you can always leave it in and just throw your new rotor over top of that, but make sure you clean the hub. And especially if you use a ring like this, you need to clean this surface. But obviously in this case, we're replacing all of this, so it's not a concern. So I just used some penetrating oil around this nut on the back side here. Just kind of sprayed it as much as possible in there. Let it soak in hopes that these splines loosen up and unseize from the inside of this wheel bearing. While this is soaking, I decided to remove the bolt for the lower control arm for the ball joint that goes into the spindle here. So I have a E14 E Torx on the end here. I used a 16 millimeter wrench on the nut on the back side. And just make sure you remember the orientation, how it goes whenever you go to replace it because it does go a specific way. It's two bolts to remove the sway bar end link. 18 millimeter top and bottom for the originals. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this absolutely sucks to remove. So why I say that is sometimes you can knock this out with an impact gun and it'd be perfectly fine, but most cases you need to get in behind here and to hold on to it. So on the other side, there was no spot to where I could lock in a wrench, I'm hoping the 16 millimeter will do it. Otherwise, this will be a crime if all this thing does is spin, but worst case, I could probably get some vice grips in here. So that was terrible. This one wouldn't back out any further. I broke one pair of vice grips. Well, actually technically two. The second pair of vice grips, I stripped the teeth holding on to the back side of here. So I gave up on that. I tried to attack the bottom, wouldn't even budge. So I decided to just cut it right here. Once I remove this strut assembly, I'll have better access to cut this one out, remove it fully. And then once the control arm's out, or even heck, I can go in this way and cut the stud off this lower portion that goes to that sway bar. So now that I'm not worried about that currently, there is a pin right here or a tab that we need to knock out. And then that'll loosen out this brake hose that goes into there. So we'll get a screwdriver. There's actually a lip on the end of it that 
we will grab onto and hold it in place and we'll just tap the screwdriver a couple times. A little stuck in there. Might be able to see a little bit of rust, but nothing too crazy. Next up, we'll knock out this remaining strut bolt here. Again, that is an 18 millimeter. You remove this nut this assembly is going to want to drop down so it might be good to get a small floor jack underneath here to support it but with the control arm and everything still in place I don't think it's going to drop too far down and it's definitely backing out which is a great sign now it's going to get a little tricky with smacking this and not messing up the threads. So now the CV axle you do not want to remove completely because once you pull this out of the transmission, if in fact you are, because oftentimes these get stuck in here, but if you are able to pull this out, you're going to leak out your transmission fluid regardless if it's automatic or like a manual transmission like this once the cv axle is out your fluid is going to leak out so we have this still in place now that gives us access to the three bolts to officially remove the problematic wheel bearing i got a e18 e torx and we'll try to use the impact gun to get it but more than likely i won't have room but if anything i'll have room for a breaker bar one out of the three removed. Definitely a situation where if you had three arms, that'd be perfect. Or at least another helping set of hands. Ah. So now with the bolts removed, We'll spray some extra penetrating oil in the back side right there. Let that soak. We have access to smack it from the back. But in a nutshell, we don't want to destroy the dust shield. The bearing, it doesn't matter. And obviously, we don't really want to smack the spindle too much because it's aluminum and that's what we'll be retaining. So as long as you can avoid those things, smack it directly back here or from the top going down, we should be able to knock this thing loose. To clarify something real quick here, my hand is actually technically on what's called a steering knuckle. Now continually throughout this disassembly process, I misidentified this and kept saying it's a spindle. That is technically incorrect. A spindle is commonly found on a rear wheel drive vehicle. Think an old square body Chevy, S10, something along those lines, but on a more somewhat modern vehicle, you tend to find what's called a steering knuckle. Main difference being, a knuckle houses a hub assembly like the one that is being replaced in this video. Got it. And that is why it gets so stuck up in there. This lip goes right into the spindle lip, rust into place, makes this extremely difficult. To And the original ABS sensor, this portion of it, got stuck inside the spindle. So make sure you remove this because it does come with the new bearing. Last step to remove this strut assembly is to knock out the three 13 millimeter bolts on the top. Now I'm not going to be able to catch it on camera, but make sure you have your opposite hand that you're not using to remove it holding on the strut itself because once you loosen these, the strut will fall to the ground. And they're kind of heavy and awkward. And for those with curious minds, I'm using a Dremel to gouge the shaft of the sway bar in link that goes into the strut. That way I can clamp on the vice grips and they bite just enough to where it holds and I can back out that nut, something that I couldn't do inside the vehicle. Depending on the headlight options that your specific Saab has, you may run into a self-leveling sensor like this one right here. Now this particular car is an aero equipped with the Xenon headlights that are self-leveling. 
the US cars, this sensor on the front is located on the driver's side. Now I just wanted to make a mention of this because in this video I am working on the passenger side that doesn't have this mounted to it. So just know if you're running into this, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's two 10 millimeter bolts to remove as well as an electrical pigtail. To remove this rear control arm bushing, I have an 18 millimeter wrench up top here. I have the impact with another 18 millimeter bit of socket on the bottom. Eighteen millimeter and eighteen millimeter again on this front bolt. Take the last thing to remove is this bottom portion of the sway bar end link that goes to the sway bar that I'll have to cut out. I did remove this inside fender liner. It is absolutely not required to do this job, but what I'm doing is rust proofing a little bit in here. I'm using some POR paint over rust 15. I'm lobbing these guys off. I'm doing rib nuts inside there. Go ahead, click up top here. I actually recently did a video on that conversion. So that's why the wheel liner's out. Also, it gives you a little more access to these bolts, but again, it is not 100% required. So now I'm gonna remove this guy, clean all of this crap off, all the scaling off the subframe, hit it with that poor 15, do some rib nuts, throw the wheel liner back in there, and then we're ready for reassembly. Removing this lower sway bar end link proved to be quite the challenge. I used a cutoff wheel on the back side of the nut, still did not remove, ran out of cutoff blades, used a sawzall on the front, and then eventually I was able to hammer this thing out. So at some point here during the reassembly, I'm going to be putting new pads in here. So we need to compress this piston. So to do that, especially if you're replacing the pads, use the original inboard pad as a guide and also as more of a flat surface to compress this in. Get a six inch C clamp, something similar to this. Make sure you take the cap off your the brake master cylinder reservoir. Go ahead and tighten this here. And what this pad does is it distributes that load all the way across the piston. That way you don't risk kind of tweaking it into an odd direction where it's gonna seize inside this caliper. So that's good to go. We'll back off this clamp, remove that, we'll take out this pad that we're not even gonna use anymore and make sure you immediately put the reservoir cap back on the brake master cylinder because the fluid, brake fluid, is what's called hydroscopic. So it actually uh, absorbs moisture. So you don't want any moisture in the system because that translates to going down in the lines. Not good for the rubber and that's what eventually can cause your brake calipers to leak. That with the build up a brake dust and stuff. So real simple to compress this. Now I'm actually on to cleaning this up. I'm gonna paint this off camera, clean some other stuff up, and then we are ready for reassembly. So this concludes today's disassembly video. I didn't want a ginormous lengthy video, so I'm actually gonna split it up into a two part series. This one obviously being about the disassembly process. I did wanna be as detailed as possible. So if you're not already a current subscriber, be sure to hit that sub button as well as that little bell icon. That way you know exactly when the part two about the detailed reassembly process drops. Now you may be able to see behind me, I did start up the cleanup process, painting that caliper and cleaning some other stuff. I unfortunately ran into a slight issue with the fender, which I'll discuss more in the next video, but be sure to stay tuned for that. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, by all means, drop a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. And with that being said, I appreciate you watching and I'll catch your friends next time.